So, hi. It's been a long day. It's been a long month. Um, so glad to see all of you. So, how many of you wish, I'm sure you wish for a lot of things, but how many of you wish that your tech company or your company looked more like Lesbian 2 Tech? So one of the things I love about technologists and people who love technology is that at our very core, we are just so passionate about solving problems, right? You just love to solve really challenging problems. Yes? Yeah. Yes? So I've got a hard problem for you, a tough challenge, one that no one, no one has been able to solve yet. How do we create companies that reflect the people who use their products? How do we create companies that actually reflect the people that live in this country? How do we change this face of technology so it doesn't look like this? And it looks more like lesbians who tech. You in? Yeah. So this is more of a call to action, right? Because we've spent, you know, companies have spent a lot of money on this issue. Um, this is a really challenging problem that many people have not been able to solve. And I'm preaching the choir a little bit, but you know the numbers. They're not good. Women, people of color, we need more data on LGBT people, transgender people. We need to do better about representing the people that live in this country at our companies, and specifically in tech, we really have to solve this problem. We've been working at this for a little bit. It's been a couple years since we really re released the first round of diversity da data, and uh, the, the next round just came out, and guess what? Not too surprisingly, it hasn't really changed. It's pretty much the same. There's been a slight improvement. Why? Why is this so hard? To be honest, societal change is hard. This may shock you, but the world is not fair. We can now predict how much money someone is going to make in their entire life by the very zip code they were born in. Does that sound like fairness to you? Does that sound like you could, everyone can pull themselves up from their bootstraps? Before they were born, we can predict how much money they will make with 90 plus percent accuracy. So things don't just change. They don't just magically change. I know sometimes it feels uh, like things do. We wake up one morning and we're like, oh, we can now get married to everyone, uh, and to anyone, not everyone, to the person that we love, but I support all of you, no judgment. But when we're talking about changing, systemic change, when we're talking about cultural change, when we're talking about changing system, systemic racism, sexism, and LGBTQ discrim discrimination, this is a huge problem. One of the examples I really like, um, how many of you have heard of the story in Norway where they passed legislation that said 40% of corporate boards have to be women, right? So one of the things we hear, whenever we hear a quota, right, we sort of go, ooh, people immediately think that we're lowering, lowering the standards. But we're not. We're just changing the criteria. Because remember, the world is not fair, and it hasn't been fair. So it's not just about quotas, it's about pushing for a more inclusive workplace. What other types of policy could we push? It's insane that we do not in this country have paid family leave yet. We have to do something about this. <laughs> that we still don't have equal pay for equal work. We have to change the way we hire talent. You know, hiring, I don't know how much you know about hiring, but hiring, from what I've learned, uh, it's been a crash course the last couple of years, hiring is all about eliminating risk, right? Companies want to be successful, they want to turn a product, product, and the best way to do that is to eliminate all sorts of risk. And in hiring, you do that two ways. You hire direct referrals, and you hire from the same schools or the same partners you've already done, because repeating that, obviously, is less risky. So is it shocking that when companies have three male, white, cisgendered founders, that the company then has a problem recruiting diverse tech talent? No, because it's all about our networks. And if we keep hiring from the same referrals, it's just going to continue to look like this photo. We also have to change where we're hiring people from. Right now, boot camps are, um, women are going to boot camps at 43% versus computer science degrees, which are 17%. Yet, companies have a lot of bias when it comes to hiring from boot camps. We have to change this because we're leaving out our best innovators. And honestly, the country, we need them more than they need us soon, because there are half a million open tech jobs, and by 2020, there are going to be a million open tech jobs. 
So this is something we have to change. So this is where you come in, you brilliant, beautiful, uh, talented people in this room. These are some of the lessons that I've learned um, that I've implemented through building Lesbian 2 Tech. You have to be intentional about representation. And you have to use data to do that, because guess what? We're all biased. We all believe that it's res less risky to hire someone who looks like us and has had our same experience, because guess what? We know that so well, and so it feels less risky. So we have to use data to do it. One of the things that I implemented from the very beginning with this was making sure that all of our speakers were 50% queer women of color. And I want to be really honest with you. When I stop paying attention to this, I start losing the goal. When I stop being intentional, you know why? Because white women apply more. My data shows by a lot. And they also ask me to speak more. They'll come up to me to speak. And guess what? That makes sense because the LGBT community, the, the women's rights community, has been mostly white women. And so we actually have to build trust. We have to give first. We've had to go and sort of, you know, sort of say, no, we are about an inclusive environment, and that takes time. But you have to be intentional about it if you really want to build that trust. We have to show up. There are two ways that you can show up, only two, with your time and with your money. And your money is a lot more scalable. <laughs> so we need all of you to go out and be as successful as you can, still having purpose and happiness and all of that. But we need you. <laughs> those are important things. Don't give those up. Um, but we, everyone in this room, has to invest in people of color, in transgender people, in women, and LGBTQ people. <laughs> whether it's backing the Edu and Coding Scholarship. Um, <laughs> one way. Or Black Girls Code, Women Who Code, you name it. Pick the cause or pick the person. Believe in the person and support them and see them through. Bring people with you. Psychology shows that when, people, when a group of people don't have as many resources, we often hold them tight. We don't feel like we live in a world of prosperity or limitless um, abundance. And so sometimes we don't, we're not the best at bringing people with us. We have to be intentional about feeling like there are limitless po possibilities. And even if I write a 10K check, you know what? I'm smart enough and I'm going to make twice as much money next year. So I'm going to be able to replace that. Even if I invest in a business and I lose that money, having the confidence and feeling like the world has more abundance for you. I know it's tough and I know it hasn't always been that way. That's something we have to actively fight. And we have to show up for ourselves. I don't know how many of you read the After Ellen piece recently in the news, but um, they are shutting down because they're not turning a profit. Um, lesbian bars are going out of business. So many people come up to me and say, you know, Leanne, we want more community outside of the summits. And I obviously listen and take notes. And I say, you know, how often do you go out? How often do you show up to other things? The truth is we can't always sit at home. We can't sometimes. We can't always sit at home watching Scandal with our cat or dog. Once a week, totally legit, twice a week, you know. But we have to show up. If we want community, we have to show up for it. We cannot opt out. One of the ways that you can show up for people is giving first, right? Remember when I talked about trust? In order to build trust, you have to give first. Um, there are a lot of LGBT groups who come up to me and say, you know, Leanne, how have you found 20,000 queer women in tech? I mean, this is a niche community. How have you found them? Um, we want more women to participate. And I say to them, I was like, do you realize that when women, when queer women walk into queer spaces, it is 70 to 90% male, and it doesn't matter what country, what industry, this is true everywhere, I've been to thousands of events, they are mostly male, unless Megan Smith is speaking and then maybe not, but... Um, <laughs> so, you know what, male allies, you have to show up for us. We've gone to your queer events when they've been mostly men hundreds of times. You need to come here, you need to show up, and you need to participate. <laughs> One of my favorite examples of giving first uh, is the White House. Um, they decided, three years ago, they decided to host an LGBTQ tech and innovation summit. 
they asked me to ha help plan it um, with a lovely Taryn Mil Miller Stevens, and we did it together. And we obviously uh, created a short list of who we wanted to hear speak. Megan Smith came to the, to the top of the list uh, for obvious reasons. She was working at Google X at the time. She said yes, she changed her summer plans to be there. And that's when the White House recruited her to be the CTO of the United States. <laughs> Because the White House was smart and decided to invest in diversity in a group of underrepresented people, they got a more than qualified candidate who is literally changing our country. We have to take risks, small risks, asking someone for coffee, deciding to speak at Lesbians U Tech, and we have to do big things. Um, I struggled whether, I, I talk about my brother, this is my brother Tim, I struggled whether or not to include him this year um, because I, I talk about him a lot and I thought, well, you know, it's been six years since he passed away, but I couldn't, for the love of me, uh, leave him out of the talk because he's so, such a part of this journey for me. And um, when he passed away, he left me his life insurance money. And it's interesting, we were talking about emotional, logical choices, right? And I had a friend who was starting a business and I just couldn't keep the money. I just couldn't do it. You know, I just didn't, I, I didn't want money that represented his death. And so I invested $100,000, all of his life insurance money, uh, into the company. And as most startups do, it failed. Um, and I lost that money. But you know what? That led me, to, and you know, he didn't have a lot of causes that he cared about. I felt like I couldn't give it to all of the causes that I loved because, you know, he loved technology. He was actually learning JavaScript. He was going to be a coder. Um, he had a lot of business ideas, so it's, it's really funny how things turned out. Um, he literally, before he died, he had a book, a JavaScript book. He was teaching himself, um, and he was already getting promoted, uh, managing all of the coders. Um, but that risk, even though I know it, there's a lot of privilege that I have to even make that choice, which I want to acknowledge, but that risk, it led me to like, realize how, how underrepresented technology, investors, how few women investors there are, how hard it is for women and people of color to get investment. It led me on this whole journey that I know for 100% is why I'm on the stage today. Without that risk, I would never be here, and you probably wouldn't be here either. That's the power of risk taking. <laughs> He's also, side note, um, we start, I started this term called Lesbro, uh, and he, I, that's what I used to call him. And so uh, he's the first original Lesbro, and we've decided to uh, coin that term and continue that term for all of our lovely male allies. So just so you know the history of that word. <laughs> Creating change is hard, right? Systemic change is hard. And I know at a, big companies, there's so much red tape and process, and it's really hard to change things when there's already a structure in place. So oftentimes it's better to do a small experiment, get the data that you need, and use that data to create change. Because we all have to test our assumptions, and sometimes getting buy-in means having that experiment, testing their assumptions because they probably don't think it'll work, using that data to convince them. Remember, I assumed that lesbians who tech would fail. Why? Because my experience showed me that women don't show up as much in the LGBT community, that it was gonna be very hard for people to leave Scandal and their cat to come out. <laughs> but I'm stubborn and I wanted to prove myself right with one final experiment. And I am so, so happy that all of you proved me wrong. But I really thought it would fail. <laughs> this is one of my favorite quotes. Maybe the best way to hire people of color and women is just to hire them. Maybe it's just that simple. Yeah. So are you with me? Yeah. Are we going to change the face of technology together? Yeah. All right, thank you.